sorry for the, the te- technical issues. Uh, we're back with uh, Shao Han. Um, hey, hey. Yeah, uh, Shao Han uh, he, him is a tabletop RPG creator, cultural consultant, and university educator from Singapore in Southeast Asia. Um, you are doing a, uh, Shao is doing a talk today about writing without culture. Some thoughts from mm-hmm. an RPGC creator on authenticity, quote unquote, uh, research, uh, historical experience, and identity in tabletop RPG work. Uh, take it away, Shao Han. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm very glad to be here today. And uh, so, yeah, well, what's the context of my talk today? Uh, the talk today is about, uh, well, about culture in many cases. Uh, for a while. Sorry, my door had, my, my door was a bit jammed. Sorry about that. So, uh, the my talk today is about culture and about uh, so-called quote-unquote culture about authenticity in the RPG creation market coming from my own angle and perspective as a Southeast Asian creator living in Singapore. So uh, what's the main gist of this? It's basically going to be a lot about, I guess, representation, about the politics and the politics of uh, representation of like uh is that is representation important is representation not important in the cultural work of like rpg design so what is this whole thing that i'm going to be doing uh so i've had some kind of like work observations in my career that i've been called in to do uh either like cultural consultant work for rpg projects or maybe i've been called in to do um uh, Maybe setting creation, world building, or maybe just like just create uh, maybe certain rules and context for a certain cultural context that in. So based upon my, uh, I guess, diverse cultural identities. And over the course of that, I've had a lot of time to think about uh, what exactly I'm doing. So when I'm doing that, when I'm accepting a contract to work, I, I don't really think about it as much as uh, I would like. But uh, with some distance and some time, I can think a bit like, all right, why am I being paid to do this? All right, and there's a lot of, I guess, discourse and questions recently about what is the role of a cultural expert? What is the role of a cultural consultant on uh, in the world of role playing games, in the world of leisure, in the world of fiction? And to, I guess, uh, that's that's really the big ballpark that I want to talk about. And uh, that's why I have also the second note there of authenticity, of historical experience. And in a way, it's like, uh, are those important things or are those unimportant? And so that's the overall kind of like ballpark that I'm going to be playing with. So the first big thing that I'm going to talk about, identity, about cultural identity, about cultural authenticity. So um, some work they have done in the recent years that I can speak because of like an NDA has been uh, released. I've been working on some work for the Pathfinder, for Paizo and Pathfinder's uh, uh, role-playing line. So they are coming up with an Asian, uh, kind of an Asian-inspired uh, fantasy uh, setting uh, that is a, a kind of a legacy setting from the first edition days, uh, from two decades ago almost. And um, my work has been to kind of like update that. So there were a lot of problems with the earlier work, which were... Uh, well, the usual kind of Orientalist problems you find in a lot of role-playing games from the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, early 2000s. And so part of the attempt in the 2020s is to, of course, hire more diverse uh, voices. So that's like when I say diverse voices, maybe you could see the invisible uh, air quote marks inside my <laughs> inside the use of the phrase. The, the reason that I talk about that is because... Uh, what exactly does that diversity mean as well? So, um, and in addition to that, recently I was also uh, invited by uh, to to work by with Duffo on Black Clot. I think that was last year to early this year on uh, to make to make a character class a playbook for the game, uh, the medical horror game. And I decided to do something that was inspired by uh, Chinese fantasy fiction, the Cultivator, kind of a mystical uh, person who con- who contains their breath, cultivates it, and is able to use it to do all kinds of uh, magical healing uh, based in parts on Chinese traditional medicine as well as folklore. And so, um, what exactly is the importance of, let's say, like a 
intuitively people are like, all right, it's good that a uh, so-and-so company hired a Chinese guy to write about Chinese things. But uh, is that actually... That's, that's sort of like, for me as a reflection, is uh, what exactly does that kind of like a intuitive supposition that is a good thing, what does it sort of stand on? What are the pillars that it stands on? And I'm going to try to unpack that a little bit. So for me, I say I'm somebody from Singapore, from uh, from Southeast Asia, and uh, I think Singapore stands as a little bit of an interesting case study because Singapore, uh, unlike the other uh, new nations of Southeast Asia, is uh, has a bit of an unusual scenario. It uh, doesn't have any kind of like a big claim over to a big imagine or a lived homeland uh, within the region. It's, a, it's not a place which is like, I can say, all right, so like uh, Malaysia, people can imagine in the popular imagination, the autochthonous people, the indigenous people, uh, the Orang Asli, the Malay, the, the Bumi Putra, the Sun, or sorry, Thailand. Thailand is where Thai people come from. Indonesia is where Indonesian people come from. And so there's a, there's a kind of a matchup between uh, whether it's accurate or not, between ethnicity and nationality. Uh, that for, for a lot of Southeast Asian nations. So for Singapore, however, uh, even though it's a majority Chinese country, uh, it's also pretty much kind of a settler country uh, as well. It's like uh, if you were to go with who were the uh, indigenous people in Malaysia, uh, even before the Chinese uh, majority came in, it was mostly settled with uh, Malay communities and before that with like uh, sea nomads and with like a uh, other other people who were themselves displaced by the waves of uh, earlier migrations. So where does that come in? It's like so as a Singaporean, and Singapore is a place where there's like a Chinese migrants came flooded in a lot during the 19th and 20th century. So I'm going around creating uh, RPG work. I'm going around doing consultancy work for people. And what is the basis of my right to do such a thing? It's like, uh, on one hand, it's like, uh, like oh, yeah, like a, a Singaporean guy. So why do you get like somebody who's from China? So uh, my privileges and my advantages uh, over my Chinese colleagues uh, from the mainland uh, or even from like uh, the Republic or the People's Republic of China or whether from the Republic of China would be mostly my connection over to the English-speaking world because uh, Singapore was colonized by the British and so uh, my connection to the Anglophone sphere is a lot stronger. So I have a lot more privileges, connections and interactions with uh, so quote-unquote Western social media, uh, Western industries than a lot of my peers might be. So a lot of people will be like, oh, okay, you must be doing this because you know a lot about this. And my university background is that I'm an Asian studies graduate, but uh, even beyond that, I'm not a Chinese Asian studies graduate. I'm not an East Asian studies specialist. I'm a Southeast Asian studies specialist. So I've been writing a lot of like uh, Chinese stuff recently. I've been writing a lot of like things about uh, Chinese fantasy, about wuxia, about uh, Chinese folklore. And I've been... It's like a... To what degree is this sort of like a... Of course, the concern from the Western world would be, all right, we got a guy with a Chinese sounding name to kind of like slap this on him. Like, all right, uh, please give your badge of authenticity as a creator. What we create now is going to speak to the universality of all Chinese experience. Now, that's, that's a bit of, that's very problematic uh, because on one hand, it's like, uh, I can't speak for all Chinese. And secondly, it's like a Chinese itself is so such a, vague term, right? It's like I, I can't speak for people from the north of China. I don't have the lived experience somewhere in the east of China. I'm from I'm from a Southeast Asian Chinese diaspora. So my suitability is due to pretty much my knowledge, my lived experiences, yes, but also because of my, I guess, ease of access uh, to the Western market and for the Western market's ease of access to me. I have, uh, I'm on the kind of social media that they are using, so it's a bit easier to work with. So what happens now is if I get to represent, let's say, like if I go and say, I represent and can speak for all Chinese, then that will be a bit of, that will be very much an act of hubris on my part. And uh, why is that an issue for RPG creation? Because I think we're, RPG creation, we are creating a lot of texts these days that are world building texts and so kind of like uh, people are very interested in this like uh, multinational, multi-corporate, uh, multicultural 
flows of uh, different media that we have. Like people, like, oh, you know, like uh, I watch uh, Chinese dramas, Korean dramas, I watch uh, South American dramas. So, like uh, we're reaching a very diverse uh, cultural diet of the world. But um, at some point, times people will be like, we also want to engage in the tropes. We also want to engage in creating genre fiction, creating stories that are based from those uh, other flows of media that we're seeing, not just the so-called the traditional canon, especially in RPGs or fantasy RPGs of like a very kind of like a, you know, tokenness uh, kind of like, or uh, even within the realms of, let's say, the OSR, the old school renaissance of like a very certain kind of like uh, idealized, grimy, dark ages vibe of the world, despite it being quite uh, perhaps ahistorical. So now people are like, all right, I want to create uh, fantasy worlds, fantasy settings, fantasy games. They are based on other societies and other things. And in a way, I feel a bit, how do I say this? Like the authenticity issue is that I always have a bit of fear that I'm going to be, that somebody is going to read my work uh, and talk about it on maybe a Chinese language web forum and say, this guy is full of shit. It's like, and then for one hand, I'm like, uh, I'm feeling a bit like stressed out. It's like, so my, the market may be like, oh, all right, person with a Chinese name, uh, you are the person who can write Chinese fantasy. And then I'm like, uh, all right, sure, I can do this for a game. And then I'm really worried that somebody will be like, this person isn't Chinese enough. He's not from China, he's from Southeast Asia. Who is he to write this? And this is totally a straw, straw person I'm talking about. They don't actually, may not even exist, but those are kind of the anxieties I have. And so that's why I'm tapping upon inside here. I also have, have like questions and concerns from like uh, colleagues and friends who say, uh, if I'm not a person from uh, so-and-so culture, so uh, who does not identify with the, with the culture and society of a certain uh, ethnic or cultural group, can I write about them? Can I write uh, to represent them? And I think for me, the big issue that comes down to it is a lot of uh, people keep having this bugbear on the back of authenticity. It's like, oh, is this authentic? Is this not authentic? I mean, for me, I feel like the big issue is uh, everything was authentic is grounded in a certain time. Uh, for us, a lot in role-playing games, we care about vibes, we care about feelings a lot, and it's not, it's not, no, not exactly doing a dissertation or doing a sustained analysis of something. So we're just sort of like trying to feel about things, right? And so I think for me, a big part of it is, I guess, a matter of uh, respect. Of course, I will feel a lot easier and better if somebody sort of like plays a certain historical game with a lot of like knowledge of the place and like oh all right i can feel like uh i can immerse in this sense of realism a lot more but uh, our game game design for role-playing games is really a imprecise and approximate art like we try to evoke we try to engage we try to deepen conversations we try to kind of create spaces carve them out and keep them for people to kind of like share and discuss and co-create with so for me, a big thing about it is, I guess, respect. I think respect and dignity is like a, a lot of older works I had to work with and look at uh, for my research and for my game design. I see a lot of like things which uh, they mix up, for example, um, Chinese names with Vietnamese names with Japanese names. Or it's like maybe you see like uh, all the villains in a certain work tend to be Japanese. So maybe there's like uh, gross misunderstandings of perhaps like people's uh, religious or cultural attitudes. And at a deeper level, even beyond that, there's also maybe the assumption by a certain uh, imagination of a Western self that uh, certain values in uh, maybe, like basically like, uh, oh, okay, when we when we watch a movie, like, uh, and then it's like the good guys are kind of like, a, let's say it's a spy trailer, the good guys are, NATO or United States coded or maybe like something like James Bond in which the person is like a imperial spy is coded as being good guy and maybe they do terrible things but for good purposes right and then the bad guys will be you know uh, would be basically usually an ethnic non-white uh, group so even that at some level if somebody was like, all right, I'm going to respectfully create a bad guy who's from, uh, who is an ethnic stereotype, and I'm going to call in somebody to do this that's going to be authentic, uh, then I don't think that's the solution. I don't think you can kind of like get a consultant or get a, 
uh, quote unquote person of color. I'm not really too fond of that term myself because it's like a it's a bit odd because it's like a, but like you get a you get a non basically non non north person to come and do things. You can end up like all right, this gives my project uh, that mark of authenticity. And I'm glad to say that I don't feel that way that much for the most of the projects that I've worked on. Some of my earlier work when I worked uh, pretty much as a starting creator when i work for like nearly anything i did have that few and but those projects thankfully uh, a lot of them gutted out and i don't have to remember them too much and i talk about about historical experience as well and because how do i say this is like uh, for us here in i guess in the asia pacific right a big thing that comes out is uh, part of my own role playing game research i'm working on this game that is about a uh, uh, Japanese uh, occupation of Singapore and it links over to what of course in the historians of the West will remember as World War II because if we were to typify and classify what conflict it is it will be all right this is the second world war uh, and but uh, here in our region uh, while it was indeed can be classified as the second world war there was also another war that was going on even before the second world war in this region and there were so many wars inside there there was of course the sino-japanese war and a lot of the japanese uh, uh war crimes in southeast asia were committed as sort of like persecution of uh, combatants or allies to the chinese armies in the sino-japanese war so but when i were, when i study this phenomena, like uh, people dying, this is the phenomena, the, of the kind of like a, 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 an actual event. Uh, if I was to look at it through the, fil the filter of World War II, and I put in a lot of concerns of, let's say, the Western historiography of World War II, and let's say I want to create a war game, I want to create a game that's based on war, my ideas about this game would be very much based on... Um, I'll take upon an extremely... American and North European perspective uh, over to this. Uh, if I was to, my other approach I've taken is to take a more local, more regional perspective. It also require me to kind of like uh, unimagine a lot of things that I kind of took for granted. And of course, the the Singapore Australia relations also are quite strong inside World War Two because one of the most uh, some of the most valiant fighters in that fought against the, the invasion in Singapore were, of course, from uh, Australian regiments. Uh, and so there's, of course, a lot of like uh, ink that's been spilled upon the rationale and the study of the bravery of the Australian soldiers in Singapore. And for me, when I look into it, that, that's another cultural universe that I'm not familiar with that I get to. And there's no one game that I can make that says, hey, this game is about World War II in Singapore. It's like even the name itself, uh, yeah, it's, it, it kind of like sets me a certain way. If I was to say this game is about the experiences of people who survived the Sino-Japanese war, then uh, it might be less good marketing to to our global market. Uh, but uh, and it kind of like sets my center more strongly over to a certain a, a local Asian regional context. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is also positionality, positionality of a creator. Uh, my own position as a person bounded in, I guess, uh, geography and political time is um, I have a lot of access to resources because uh, of the privilege of my education, my global connections, my interactions with people. Uh, but I can also kind of have a lot of sensitivities to uh, a lot of things which my American and European colleagues might take for granted, especially for those who come from maybe very vast uh, powers where everything globally is seen in the lens of the local. And for me, as a person from a small state, I don't have that sort of like ability to do that. Uh, everything that is global is, uh, affects my, 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 my locality and my everyday life. And so for me as a creator, as a consultant RPG work, there's a lot of like flows of information of like identity that I can play with and I think really for RPG creators for any kind of creative work is I'd like you to think a little bit about invite you to think a little bit about what exactly is it that uh, you wish to say and what exactly is it that you wish to use your identity to say there's something that perhaps um, only you can say and even though it might look like uh, for us here in 
the Asia Pacific were further away from a lot of like so called quote unquote the opportunities right that the North and the creators of the North right uh, basically hold for themselves. I still think there's something very worthwhile and unique about our positions, our voices. Like uh, in context of this, is, I'm very grateful for, for companies to, to seek me out as like, oh, all right, you are a creator that's in uh, Southeast Asia, we'll ask you to work on things. And sometimes when I go over to the West, like for last year when I was with, I, I met Aaron at Big Bad Con in the US, I did definitely feel a certain sense of like, a, okay, I'm not, I don't, I don't know a lot of people here. I don't have like, for example, the lift experience that allows me to have the frequencies, the tempo, the cadence of, oh, let's just meet for coffee. Okay, let's engage in this project. So uh, even though I do not think anybody by, I don't think everybody uh, views exclusion as the main priority. All right, let's keep this without. But there is a very real, very tangible sense of, being doing your own things over in elsewhere and i want to kind of like i guess just reiterate and repeat that i don't think that um firstly i don't think we need to be to kind of like reiterate like a, a phrase that we heard a lot while uh we keep hearing a lot i don't think we need to be in the same table as others like uh, it's good i feel happy to be a guest to be invited to work on projects but i feel that my center is still my own uh, that I would like to kind of like encourage for identity. Like uh, we are creators that, well, I mean, we want success. We want, and then the gl biggest global market right now is, of course, uh, the global West, right? So uh, that's the one of the disposable income that spend things. Uh, and that's good to want to, to, to aspire to that kind of success, to aspire to that kind of thing. But um, I don't think we necessarily need to fall into either the pitfalls of, all right, I'm going to be your uh, rubber stamp to prove, to, to make, to make a certain kind of a IP. I don't think we even need to go as far as to say like, I now need to be the person who creates, who you can, you can, it's like kind of like, what's that? Like a, a you can have a, you can consume this work with a, with a clear conscience because it's been created by people who quote unquote own the cultural resources, the intangible heritages of all these things. I don't even think it's that, uh, even though that's what the market might think. But for us as creators, I think the most important thing is actually we have something to say and there's a lot of like uh, things which perhaps only our particular intersections of identity experiences might end up talking about. And I would really like to see and hear a lot of things which are maybe not even hyper-local, but um, something which people may not speak about so much in the world, but things that are of importance to people's, uh, maybe their lived experiences growing up, maybe particular TV shows, particular localities. And in this realm of like uh, going back to cultural flows all around the world, maybe other people can enjoy that. This idiosyncrasy is right. Like uh, it doesn't have to be dominated by like uh, the North American tastemaker market. Uh, it's like a... Uh, I would like to see like, you know, thousands of gardens that kind of like blow, bloom forward in which uh, we have all these uh, different identities, different people creating very different games, which all share the same category, games, uh, same language, play, uh, but uh, can do very different kind of things across the world. So I'm not sure whether that's, uh, whether, whether I still have time, Aaron, I'm like uh, behind time by a bit. Uh, or should I still have time or do I think, or should I close it off here? Oh, okay. Right. So I guess like uh, really in standing to that is, uh, I would also like to kind of caution against kind of like uh, using the nation state as the ultimate level of uh, authenticity decider. It's like, all right, this person lives here, this person lives there. It's like uh, I have, we have friends who have family who are all across the world. And um, like uh, if like we're such a diasporic kind of like uh, identity for us as role-playing game creators, right? And I do feel a lot like uh, there is a bit of a, almost like a purity test that comes in sometimes. It's like, were you here? Do you fight the struggles of this particular community? If you're not, you don't have the right to call yourself a member of this community. But um, I don't know why there's a turn towards such uh, essentialization. Like I thought, like you know, the last twenty years, thirty years, uh, people have been fighting against such uh, 
pigeonholing of identities that all right if you don't eat rice you're not you're not asian like you know like like and then like uh i'm i'm personally like the thing that pisses me out of is uh, all those memes about that 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 that, that uncle roger hack guy it's like you know oh what do you do with a rice it's like it, it kind of like totalizes everything into a particular identity it's like yeah of course i put my rice in water if i'm making parboiled rice if i'm making uh, long grain rice I, I do that it's like uh and i think that is something i like to kind of like uh caution like in, while we are trying to market ourselves to an imagine or real global west or global north to kind of like uh, turn ourselves into kind of like uh, self-essentialize ourselves uh, i don't think it's going to be very helpful if we move away from a time where you have people who are not from the lift world come in and make a whole bunch of bad stereotypes or rentally stereotypes and uh, other kind of stereotypes and then uh, depict that as being the absolute truth and then we ourselves read it and then like oh yeah this is the truth about us like you know like i'm thinking about you 1990s white wolf rpg design of like you know like uh, different clans and tribes of like you know ethnic stereotypes right but uh it will also be quite bad if we move into the present day in the 21st century in which you see people uh maybe representing themselves as stereotypes over to other people like oh you know yeah like you know my people we all do mystical dragon bullshit it's like um I think like um, that self essentialization then we haven't shifted very far uh, uh, from there. And I, so I'll just like to kind of like uh, close off and caution that. And yeah, so I think I have two yeah. more minutes, right? And I think I'll just talk about like enclosing a story that I heard from uh, nearby my area uh, in Singapore. So there's this like, uh, we have a lot of old shrines because it's a, I live in a city which is kind of like consuming the the forests and the swamps and the, and the mangroves. So there's a big old tree in one housing estate where there's like a tree shrine. People pray to the god of the tree for wealth and luck and health. And uh, so one of my one of my researcher colleagues had told me about this story. He heard from his senior in which uh, somebody from the government uh, wanted to find out more about this tree shrine so they could archive it and they could uh, preserve it as, as a heritage for, for for the future to know about this living history. And so uh, the researcher went down to the shrine and then he tried to find the temple uh, attendants and everyone was busy, everybody, nobody, uh, some people couldn't speak English so they had to get somebody who could speak the Chinese dialects there. And uh, once they found somebody, the person said, all right, we have a book for you. Then the person said, all right, yes, this is very good. We can add to the research of the tree that we know. Uh, everything we know about the tree, the tree god comes from this book. And then the person reverently takes out a book. And the book is actually published by the same guy who's been researching the tree because that was his first edition of research about the tree that he did maybe 15 years ago. And he just had a couple of paragraphs on the tree god. And then people went to this guy. They don't know who he is because it's just a name on the book. They go to this government researcher and they say, this is all the knowledge that we know about the tree. And uh, this is like uh, the source of all the knowledge. And then, of course, the researcher was devastated. Uh, but um, there's something else there, right? There's like two decades, three decades of lived stories, experiences inside there. They can't be compressed into, I guess, paragraphs. They can't be compressed into things. They kind of form our secret tensions, our worries, our biases, our concerns, our interests that we all of us have as subjective uh, creators, right? And I want to kind of like uh, toast to everyone to kind of create all your own things. And yeah, that's it, that's it for me. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aricia. Thanks, everyone, for having me here.